before we get started on today's episode, I'd like to introduce to you our Black-Owned Business of the Week, where we showcase quality Black-owned businesses for you to support every week. This week's business is Soul Star Tea and Wellness, based out of Virginia Beach, where they have high-quality artisan teas crafted using premium tea leaves, organic herbs, pure spices, dried fruit, and other natural ingredients. Available to you on their website to order, including two of my personal favorites, Sweet Mahogany Roast and Tropical Cider. If you're a tea lover, be sure to visit their site so you don't miss out. As mental health awareness continues to rise, more and more people begin to seek therapy and reap tremendous benefits as a consequence of that. On this week's episode of the Infusion Breakdown Show, the Breakdown Crew sat down among ourselves with two very special guests, brand new guest Paul Ganga and returning guest Anthony Garcia from the Attention Collection Podcast to discuss, do people really want to heal? As well as, how does one find a good therapist? Let's see what we come up with. So the question we have for today, do people really want to heal? Comment below. Let us know your opinion. We also have timestamps in the description below. As always, be sure to check them out. Today's guests also include Paul and returning guest Anthony Garcia. All right. So for me, so last time we spoke about this, my immediate response was yes. And but I always like kind of preface that with uh, believing that people do want to like better themselves and their lives. And I always felt like I'm mean, healing and addressing like whatever type of tra traumas you have in that in your life are part of that. So I'm thinking like, well, yeah, so people sh should want to um, like get better and address those traumas. But uh, some of the things you, you guys said, um, I did have to like take a bit of a step back uh, because I, I guess if you kind of take he healing and uh, mental healing and kind of compare that to uh, working out and like changing your body physically, like if whatever physical goals you might want to have, um, people could say like, oh, I don't look how I don't like the way I look right now. Um, I want to change X, Y, Z by myself but they don't actually want to do the work of working out, going to the gym and all that. So then if you kind of apply that same thinking to uh, mental healing, um, cause people might, people might know like I have this issue in my life um, that I, I, I need to address, but they're just not taking the time to give uh, attention to that. So, um, and like they're they're just, they're just kind of living with it. Um, I, I think like last time, Brian, you kind of gave the example of like people saying like I know like this is just the way I am, rather than uh kind of kind of like taking steps to address that. So I, I guess in that viewpoint, I I can also kind of say uh no, but I mean I don't know. I don't I don't really like saying no. People don't want to heal so I, don't, I, I feel I feel like just saying yes sounds better uh give everyone the benefit of the doubt I mean because a lot of times it also comes like to uh to knowing that you have to take those steps or knowing what steps to start even start out with so that's my take on it well you kind of bled into to my take on it and my reason for why I say that people don't really want to heal is just because a want without any sort of action is a wish yeah. And if you truly want something, there's some sort of uh, accompanying action, whether it be with any uh, other kind of goal you set, whether it be a financial goal, a physical goal, um, some sort of craft that you're working on, any of those things. If you actually want to do it, it requires some sort of work. And with this, like, uh, I guess some of the common barriers, people will say that they know exactly what's wrong with them, but they don't make any effort to fix it or, this, like you said, just the way that they are. And that, that truly, to me, demonstrates a lack of what? I mean, there's, there's no action to it. Yeah. You, you're, you're conscious of it. It's in your perimeter and your peripheral, peripheral vision, but you have no intention of doing anything, at least not at that current point in time. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, uh, Anthony, you, I, I want to hear your point of view on this because we had a week since last, last time we discussed this and... Uh, Maybe you have some additional thoughts to bring to that, but one of the things you had at the end, I want you to, I'm gonna ask you to bring it up again, your analogy. Yeah, I think it's interesting, Paul, that you talked to the 
the physical side of things. Like if somebody wants to improve their physical well-being, right, it's on them to recognize the need and then do something about it. I think the difference here is that, you know, for instance, if I'm overweight and I want to lose weight, if I recognize I'm unhealthy, if I recognize I have significant health issues, generally speaking, I'm not going to blame McDonald's, right? I'm not going to blame the food industry and point elsewhere. I'm going to, I'm going to look at myself and even if it's an unhealthy response to myself, I'm going to find the problems within me. I've never heard too many people who are, you know, overweight or struggling with, you know, their physical health, blaming food companies and grocery stores and, and big food, you know, but I, I do hear this. And I think this is where it transitions because my position is that I do think people want to heal, but I think they have to recognize first that they're in need of healing. Because when we're looking emotionally, when we're not looking at the physical and the outside, when we're looking at our, our emotional, our mental well-being, a lot of times we, we are looking outward. We are pointing fingers. We are saying this trauma happened to me at a certain point in my life. These people did this to me or these people didn't do for me what they should have done for me. And so because I'm more oriented to look outward and point fingers in, in my mental and emotional well-being, I don't necessarily recognize that I need to heal. That even though that stuff was done to me by somebody else, whether it was indifference or malicious intent, mm -hmm. and, and I could, I could spend my entire life bitter at these people for what they did, but at the end of the day, I have to recognize that it comes back to me. I am the one left with these wounds. I'm the one left with something to do about it. And Brian, I think uh, the point that you're, uh, referencing is, you know, if somebody were to come up to you and, you know, under the cover of night and pull out a blade and slice your arm, right? And completely just this huge gash in your arm and then they disappear and you stand there and you look at this wound and it's open and it's gushing blood. And then instead of immediately going to do something about it, instead of immediately calling for help or getting to the ER, you just stand there and wait for that person to come back and stitch it up. You stand there just, just, I can't believe they did this to me. Meanwhile, you're bleeding out. And then, you know, if you don't bleed to death, at some point, that open wound is going to get bacteria. And, it's, and all of a sudden, now you're going to become toxic, right? The, the, the internal situation is going to become dire. And you might ultimately end up either not bleeding out or you're just going to die from disease that is spreading through your system. And I think that's what it comes down to with internal healing. We have been wounded, right? We've been hurt by somebody or somebody's. And instead of just saying, look, it wasn't fair, it shouldn't have happened, but it's on me to do something about it. I think we tend to sit around and wait for other people to own, you know, the things that they did wrong, or we wait for other people to come fix it. Or even if we know that person can never do anything, we wait for someone else, right? If, if we were hurt by a relationship, somebody did us wrong. We wait for our new relationship to come patch up the wound that somebody else left. So we're not taking ownership. We're not recognizing we have to own the wound and we have to do something to find healing. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you actually added some extra padding to that and I was able to flesh that idea a little bit more. It's actually really interesting. The next day after we originally had the recording, so last Sunday, I saw a post on Instagram from this woman that I follow. We follow each other. And she had said something along the lines of uh, about healing. And she said that she needs, in order for her to heal, she needs the person who did whatever it was to apologize and acknowledge this. And it was like this long, you know, from create mode on IG, it was this long paragraph essentially justifying that line of thinking. And that's not going to get you anywhere. It, it abdicates any sort of responsibility as you had, like you said, if you were to take a physical wound, it's not your responsibility. It's not your uh, it's not your fault that that happened to you. That in fact you were stabbed, but it's your responsibility. You have to do it because if you don't, no one else will. You are the one that is solely responsible for your healing. And I think a lot of people don't like to face that fact. They don't like responsibility, and they may feel like okay, this was unjustly done to them, which in most cases it is. But that's not something that we can really get caught up into because you, the time that you spend uh, concentrating on that could be time that you exert towards actually healing yourself and moving moving the needle forward in a positive direction. So pointing, uh, playing the blame game doesn't really get you anywhere. Like we can all empathize and, and, and say, okay, yes, that should not have happened to you, but what are you going to do about it? You know? 
it's like it's like going out you're on a hike right you're out in the wilderness by yourself and a, a rattlesnake pops out of a bush and just lunges at you and gets your leg right and bites you and and then slithers off in the distance it's as if you sit down on the ground and wait for that snake to come back and suck the poison out like it, that's how <laughs> ridiculous it is it's not going to happen the snake came out of nowhere you didn't expect it you didn't entice the snake you weren't like poking a stick at it and getting it riled up you were minding your own business the snake came out of nowhere got you but you, nobody in their right mind would ever wait for that snake to slither back and make it right. Like, all right, you know what? That was my bad. Let me suck the poison out. You can get back to your life. Be as foolish, just to put it bluntly, as laying there and I'm not moving until the snake comes and fixes the situation. No, you're going to get help. You're going to scream at the top of your lungs. You're going to wave your arms. You're going to drag yourself somewhere to somebody who can help you. And I think if we could take that lens and put around to our internal well-being, right? You might have been bitten. You might, but but snake bites, as Wayne Dyer said before, a snake bite will never kill you. Never. You don't die from a snake bite. It's the venom that courses through your veins over time that ends up becoming toxic and killing you from the inside. It's funny, every time you give an analogy on this uh, particular point, it becomes more and more apparent and more and more ridiculous how that line of thinking is. And I guess the biggest cognitive shift for a person to have is one of taking responsibility for the healing, whether or not you believe that people truly do or don't. That That's what really, I feel like, separates people. Like the people who choose to take responsibility for themselves and the other ones who don't and have a, a, a sole perspective of externally focused. Joshua does. Um, I'm curious to what you guys have to say on the topic. Uh, Des can go first. He's cool. Um, you know, my take on it really pretty, uh, it hasn't really changed at all. Um, I still think, you know, overall, I don't think people as a whole, well, I won't say as a whole, because it's very, it's very, it's a lot of generalization when I say that. But I'll say that I don't think people on a hill, and I think to kind of just reference my, you know, previous statements on it, I don't think that people on a hill because I think it's a lot easier to just accept your what is than you know consistently trick your mind or convince yourself that there's something better because it's a very daunting task to do. You know, I can remember early on in my stages of healing. You know, because I'm. I'm one of the people here that went to therapy and, you know, sought out what was really wrong for me, addressed, you know, the childhood situations that, you know, made me the person who I was at that given time. But it was a hard process to go to, go through to get to the state that I'm currently in. And I mean, even still, I'm still actively healing, but it's a very daunting task because there's so many components that you just can't control. And I think for the most part, as a, as a, you know, group of people, we, we crave that control. We like to have some form of control over our realities. And when it comes to that healing, you, you just don't, because you're not going to get that apology that you may be looking for to move on. You know, you're not going to go to therapy and be told what you need to be told. You're going to be told, I'm sorry, you're not going to go to therapy and be told what you want to be told. You're going to be told what you need to be told. Like there's so many components that we just don't have control over when it comes to healing, that it's just better to kind of accept the situation for what it is. And as damning as it sounds, it's a, it's kind of a reality of what is because there's a lot of people in this life that can just admit what's wrong with them and then continue to do that same thing over and over again. Like it's a, you can find it in some of your best friends, you can find it in some of your worst enemies. A lot of people are very, very consciously aware of what they go through and are totally fine with continuing to go through it now that doesn't mean that you know just as a consensus because I know the start of it, it was a lot of generalization but as a consensus I think we do want to heal but I think it's a uh, few far and in between of those people that you can point out that are actively healing now that's not to say that they will go their entire lifetime not you know going through some form of a healing process because uh, you know death can sometimes trigger that children can sometimes trigger that but it's like just for you as the person do you want to heal I'll, I'll always say no there has to be something outside or some some external factor that pushes you to want to heal
Yeah, I actually kind of want to add to that a little bit because like when you're saying uh, an, an external factor to push you to want to heal, because um, I feel like with people, um, I feel like it kind of it kind of does get to that point sometimes where it's usually kind of like a last straw and it's like, okay, now I'm like that happened, like I'm kind of sick of it. I need to address this or I need to seek help. Um, so it's but it's kind of interesting to think about because I feel like, um, I mean, it's a little different for everyone, but maybe sometimes you just, I mean, you, you might not get to that point till a certain time in your life, I don't know, like your, your 40s or like uh, that's your last straw or um, yeah, like you, you just might not know like how to go about it. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely an awareness factor. You know, fortunately for me, like I grew up with conscious parents that may not have known how to react to, you know, the things that were bugging me, but they knew to push therapy. Like, hey, maybe you need to go talk to somebody, figure out some things. And I'll tell you at, you know, 17, 18 years old, I was very, I had a little bit of narcissism. I mean, like I was just like everybody else. I don't need anybody to tell me about myself. Like I can, I can figure it out. And it only got worse. Like, because you get out into society, like, you know, you go to college, there's so many personalities or so, so many energies that are mixing. And if you don't know who you are as a person, when you get out there and you, you know, integrate with, you know, the, the real world in itself, like you at times can create like this false sense of security. Like, you know, you're just, you're just blending in, you're having a great time. But it, as soon as that, that false, you know, sense of security goes away, you know, there's nobody to relate to, but yourself, unless you find somebody to trauma bond with, it's like, you, you have to figure it out. And I, that's exactly what I went through on my end. Like I can tell you, I've, I was actually talking to my mom about this at, um, at lunch today, because so often, you know, I'll talk to some of my older relatives and, you know, my, my older relatives will tell me, yeah, your mom tells me you don't do much. You just, you just stay to yourself. You do a, you work and, you know, you got your extracurricular stuff going. I'm like, I always tell them, but you have to realize that even though we didn't talk at the time, 17, 18, you know, 19, 20, I did a lot of, and I even told Brian this, like I did a lot of stuff that, you know, no 17, 18 or 19 year old had no business doing, you know, whether it was drinking, smoking, going out to parties, whatever. Like, it, obviously that was a common thing, but as far as like the, the volume at which I was doing, it was a lot higher. And so, you know, that, that's just like, I, I've, I've already gone through the healing process. I already understand. I acknowledge that there was something pushing me to, you know, commit those actions. And so it's really hard for me to, you know, and to kind of answer the question, what I was going to say is, as you were mentioning the third, um, you know, the, the external factor, one thing that my dad really pushed on to me was you, you know, you, it's not that you never really know till you know, but you're, you're going to get to this point where you're sick and tired of being sick and tired. And that's really when everything you know, switch. That's when that, that, that flips in my head switched. And I, and I was like, all right, I, I need to do it. Because I, as I said before, like I, my parents pushed me to therapy when I was 17 or 18 and I went and didn't care for it at all. And then I went back when I was 22. And of course it was, you know, right before I had my son, but it, it that wasn't like, he wasn't the reason I went. I, it, I really went because I just couldn't figure life out. I couldn't figure out what, it, who I was as a person, what I was going to be doing with my life, what my story would be. Like, I, I was just, I was anonymous to myself. Um, before I actually go, was, did Paul, Anthony, or even Brian, did you guys have ever had that moment that Des is talking about as far as being sick of tired, being sick of tired? And you're like, and you realize it to the point that you have to actually have to heal. Was there actually ever a one moment for you guys or was it like an overtime thing? Yeah, I think I've touched on this previously on other episodes that we've done in the past, but it was a consequence of how I conducted myself in a relationship towards the end of uh, my, my university career. And after that, I had realized some of the, the patterns, some of the behaviors, some of the, the, the thoughts, my train of thought entirely uh, was causing me to be miserable. And I was tired of being the author of my own misery. And that's when I began to do more reading into how the mind works to make an effort to understand myself and just pouring through books, pouring through podcasts, uh, audio books, anything I could find on the subject. So that was pretty much the catalyst because I realized that if I didn't do anything, I was 
pretty much damned to repeat the same things in the future. Yeah, I think for me, you know, some people have those acute moments, that acute trauma, you know, something immediate and painful and obvious. For me, it was more of like a dull ache, right? A, a long lasting dull ache, this sense that something's not right, that something could be improved, that something can be better. And I think, you know, the quieter you get, like if you're busy, especially when you're younger, you've got a lot of people around you or you're keeping up with school and extracurriculars and everything else, it's it's easier to drown that voice out, even though it doesn't go away, right? It's bubbling up below the surface. And I think that's where the festering stuff happens that people do end up getting into trouble and going off the deep end because it's that bubbling up underneath and you don't recognize. At first you don't recognize it. And then when you start to, you kind of ignore it and you just keep trucking along and you keep moving. So for me, it was more that. It was like this gradual, bubbling up until eventually you recognize, okay, something's amiss here. Something's not right. Something needs to be addressed. And that I think was kind of, so it wasn't an event. It was just a, a long standing experience with that, that ache, that dull, something needs to change kind of thing. Yeah. And it was, uh, it was kind of a similar thing for me too. Um, a I guess it, it was a little bit of both, um, an event and, uh, just over time. Uh, because I, well, like I had mentioned last time, uh, like being in a long-term relationship and we've talked about just like next steps in the relationship. And uh, one thing that's always been uh, suggested to me, like by my older brother and just people around me is premar premarital counseling. Um, so one day me and my girlfriend were talking about that. And I just, just started kind of thinking of, along the lines of, well, before we go into this, uh, together like I feel like we should also take time to uh just like you know seek our own counseling seek our own counseling ba uh, basically so yeah uh, after that um I because I had ar always known about like therapy like I've had friends who went through it um mm -hmm. but I guess at the time I wasn't really l looking for like what yeah, what, what I need to heal in my life. Like there was things that I start, I was noticing about myself and like the way I went about life. Like at the time it, it was kind of just like, I was, I was just living, like do, doing the day-to-day -day stuff. Um, uh, but yeah, like when we, when we got to that point and like, I started just thinking more about like what the future would be like uh, having kids and stuff like that. And it's like, well, I don't really know if I like, I'm in a place to even really start taking those steps like I feel like I gotta um get myself right first because like even though like I am in this uh, like great relationship and have other things going good in my life I just felt like my life overall like my view on life just wasn't uh at a place where I would want to say like I'm ready to like start taking these next steps um so yeah so so then that's when I started just making a call to or just looking for a therapist and then yeah, eventually. Maybe, I just want to maybe take a, a second to point out how commendable that is. The fact of you being brave enough to take that step to go to therapy. Cause that's, that's where a lot of people get lost. Yeah, a lot of people like the stage fright when it's time to do that. But not only the fact of you doing it, but doing it as a precautionary method, you weren't reacting to anything. You did that in preparation for the future. So I think that that's a, uh, I, I wish that more people would adopt that approach because obviously therapy is very good for fixing things that may have scarred us in the past, but I don't think people have that paradigm on therapy as it being uh, a useful tool as a precautionary method for you to prepare for something that has yet to happen. Yeah. Um, but when it comes to the actual question, um, I've actually. I it mine what I said from last time hasn't actually changed at all either. Um, but I do hear everybody's actual take and I do actually agree with most of you guys. Um, but I say yeah, that people do actually want to heal, they just don't know how. Um, or they don't uh have the time to actually seek how because of life, you know, uh being all busy, you got the job you're trying to take care of, you have or rent you just do and shit like that so basically because of life and people uh, and uh re and people are raised a certain way too like uh, men raise a certain way women are raised a certain way and 
most of the time my parents aren't afforded the opportunity to to have to have the realization to know how to heal which they so they can't pass that uh, down to us either so I feel like a lot of times people don't know how to heal and I think it could be like a psychological type of thing too because like I when you say people don't want to heal it's like like biologically we're the same for the most part but psychologically we aren't like i remember when tyler tyler the creator said something about cyberbullying he was he like he made a fun pe of people who like who got cyberbullied he was like yeah i'm getting bullied on the internet he's like if you're getting bullied on the internet get the fuck off the internet like like what's going on with that like who cares like cyberbullying is, isn't actually a thing you know what i mean that's what you're trying to say and i was thinking like but this generation was raised to go on the internet and stay on the internet which means it's more psychological so what if it's more psychological people just don't want to not not that they don't want to heal they psychologically they don't know how to heal they're stuck in that way i know Dez said last time it was more of a, like an addiction that uh, that them being in their way but more of it's what is more psychologically they don't know how to get out of their way that's a part of the healing process though like learning to get out of your way that's that's part of the healing process and that, that's why like i have to take that i have like when I say no, it's not because like I think people are disingenuous or stupid or incapable. It's just because there's just an acknowledgement of of what is like the like I keep saying healing is a daunting task because for, for me it was almost like the analogy of being locked in a room like mentally and I just have nothing but four walls and I, all my thoughts are just bouncing off of each wall and I'm, I'm going mad. Like, that's not how it is for everyone, but for someone like a think, like an overthinker like myself, like that's how it is. So I can just imagine if you give life that much thought as I do, not everybody wants to go to that, go through that. Like a lot of my, my friends won't go through the same healing processes that I went through. And that's not to say that they won't ever heal, but as far as what I personally had to do and you know, where I'm at right now, knowing that people want to get to, you know, some overall balanced level of life, like it, it requires a lot. And it is, you don't even have to go through a lot of trauma in your life to like, you know, have to, you know, get to that point where maybe you need to go to therapy, or maybe you need to actively heal. But like to just be at that level of balance takes a lot. And I think honestly, it's a different conversation too and this is a blanket statement. And it's not true across the board. But for sure, guys culturally are just subtly you know if not explicitly taught to kind of just keep feelings bottled mm -hmm. keep them under the surface like don't talk about them and if you're gonna cry go somewhere else and do that and then get your shit together and then come back right that's kind of the that's how it is and so you know it's that saying you can't heal what you won't reveal that that's huge like if i'm not willing to come out with it Nothing's gonna happen. Like I'm not gonna be able to do something. I'm covering it up. Like it's it's not I'm covering this wound uh, with you know a salve and and a cloth. It's not I'm like hiding it and therefore nobody can address it. I can't do anything with it. It's just gonna fester. It's just gonna get worse. And so I think you know in in certain groups and certain friendships when you can talk more about your problems and talk more about what you're going through and struggling with in certain communities and certain cultures right and whether it's religious communities whether it's you know fraternity whatever it might be there are some context in which we openly address stuff but for the most part by and large across culture it's just not a thing right and and if you do talk about certain things whether you are, whether it's said out loud or there's this kind of this, you can tell by the way people are looking at you, you, you get seen as weak. And the first time you open up to somebody and you get even an inkling that they're looking at you like you're weak or like you're less than, or like, oh, really? You deal with that? Most people just bottle that back up, close it back up, and then don't address it, which of course is the worst possible thing you can do because it's just going to get worse. It's just going to get harder. It's just going to get deeper. And, and it's just going to, you know, you're going to implode at some point. Gotcha. I want to take a second to talk about therapy uh, in particular. So the three of you guys, Anthony, Paul, and Des, you guys have been to therapy. And I have a few questions about that as someone who is uh, looking forward to beginning it in some capacity, just, just for I guess I, I feel there's a tremendous benefit to therapy, whether or not you're somebody who's had something uh, particularly atrocious happen to you or whether you're just someone who's just been 
uh, raised and just this, this creates a thing called life and you're looking to improve your situation and learn from the past and, and set things right. Kind of like what you were saying, Paul, it wasn't something like you were a survivor, some vicious assault or anything like that. You were prepared. And uh, so what are some of the barriers that you guys think or misconceptions that people have about therapy? And then I have a follow-up to that. Um, I would say one of the maybe misconceptions is that it's well no people don't realize that it's a long process and a hard process like Des was saying um I mean just speaking to a therapist like they they tell you they, they don't tell you what you want to hear like they tell you yeah basically like I said they tell you what you need to hear um and sometimes like that can get uncomfortable and you like might have a thought and it's like, oh, well, I didn't realize that, that about myself or like I noticed that about myself, but I didn't look at it in that way. Like I didn't realize that I actually am hurting myself by continuously doing uh, X, Y, Z action. Um, so that, that, that that's that's one of the things. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Like just not the, the process, the length of the process. It's not going to be like a it's not going to be like, oh, go to therapy for three months and your life is better. Um, I mean, but I mean, but you, also to add to that, though, I feel like you you only need to go as long as you feel like you need to go. Because like, if you're in that session, um, talking and like, you don't want to be in that session, you're not gonna get the benefits of it at the same time. Um, so, so I feel like it's good to to go for just getting the tools um, that you would help that you would get from speaking to a therapist. Um, and just that thought process that you that you get. Um, I definitely agree with all of that. I, I would to add on to it. Um, I think people go there for. Um, I, I could say a common misconception is that when you when you go to therapy, it's you going to be judged. And, and part of it, when you do go to therapy, you, you essentially get like, uh, like you're naked. Your life is, you know, on the table or on, in this case, a therapist's tablet to t try and dissect. And, and just as Paul said, like, that's a, it, it's extremely uncomfortable when you get to that point. So um, a lot of it's actually just the, like, fear of the unknown. Like, there really is, like, when I... um when I was first recommended therapy, I didn't, I didn't know what to expect. Like really one of it was just the judging aspect. Like, I don't need anybody to judge me. I don't like you. It's a, it's an extreme misconception that you feel like maybe you're going to get judged or uh, it's going to be a waste of your time or whatever. Like you think you have everything figured out and th that's the furthest thing from it. You know, I, I went into therapy, you know, at the time of where it was successful in my life, not knowing who I was and I left therapy not knowing who I was but I was given the tools to find out who I was and I think when people go into therapy they think that they're going to you know be given all of the answers that they want when in fact you're just given the tools or the instruments to get the answers that you want yeah I think for a long time I don't, I don't know that it is this way anymore but I think for a long time people associated therapy with psychopathy right i have to really be off the deep end to to go into therapy like i have to have a, a series event where i've you know i just snapped from reality was running through the streets naked and so now i got to be dragged into a therapy session and that's not the case i think i think we're getting away from that fortunately as a culture and now you listen to a podcast and you're hearing about like you know, talk therapy all the time. It's it's becoming normalized. So I think that was a big misconception for a long time. But I think now it's almost the reverse, right? It's it's not a question of am I above therapy? It's a question of is am I worthy of therapy? Like is my situation deserving of sitting and talking to somebody? Do I really need like that's for somebody who's really struggling on this level. And I don't know if my situation warrants having those conversations. But I fundamentally believe that therapy should be treated like 
just like we treat when, when a baby is born, they, they immediately see the doctor and they're checked out and evaluated. And that's a regular process. You're constantly going to the pediatrician as you grow and you're checking your markers. OK, you're at this place right now, you know, and, you know, you're heading towards these things and we're keeping an eye and evaluating stuff all the way into adulthood. I think uh, mental health should be treated the exact same way. I think everybody should have access to and should participate in some level of, of therapy. And, and I think another issue that we have to overcome is that there are so many different methods for therapy, right? Some people thrive in having video sessions with a therapist that they're never actually gonna sit physically in front of, but they're gonna talk to via text or over video. And then some people that just doesn't work for them. They need that, I need to be able to see you. You need to be within six feet of me to actually know you're a real person there who cares. Uh, and then there's, you know, other forms of therapy that are not so much the theoretical, you're not sitting and just talking through questions, but it's more practical, you're doing something, you're noticing triggers, and then you're responding in certain ways, like cognitive behavioral therapy. So I think that's the other hill that we have to climb is that there's no one way to do therapy. And that because there's no one type of person, I think what Josh was talking about is really important, this idea that uh, that there's there's just different ways of going about things. And it's not so much the physical, we're so much alike physically, but psychologically, we're so different, right? We have different personalities, uh, different ways of viewing the world. And there's so many different ways to approach therapy. And I think if more people saw that and more people were given access to it and tried it, I think, I think we'd all be better off. I like the fact that you, you're mentioning I think we talked about this last time as well, the different kinds of therapy, whether it be the CBT or exposure therapy, like there's a multitude of different flavors that therapy comes in and there's there's one that could suit one person better than the other. But I also want to point out the fact of, uh, you, you made a good case for how widely accepted and accessible it is. I don't think people understand exactly how accessible it truly is. Like there's an app called BetterHelp or yeah, BetterHelp that I've heard about on a podcast I listen to called The Psychology Podcast. And this, I think they're sponsored by them, but just the fact that they have a specified app with trained professionals that are really uh, ready and willing to help you instead of you having to go uh, and sit on someone's couch and, and look at blobs of ink and, and describe it. Like, like a lot of people have that, that outdated perspective of what therapy is. Like, I'm pretty sure that's still a component and it has some utility, but there are so, so many more methods and so many different uh, parts of therapy that are utilized and, and used to treat people like yourself and I yeah and I think you know what you just talked about that app you know and there's more than one but yeah that's definitely one of the bigger ones right now maybe that's not your end all be all maybe that's your bridge right somebody who's on the fence and doesn't know if it's for me if I try this out and I recognize oh this could be beneficial maybe I get off that video chat or maybe I get off that conversation and I don't feel like my life has changed but I get like a glimmer of hope that something beneficial could come from this, that might be a bridge enough to get somebody into a deeper level of therapy or different kinds of therapy. So yeah, I think you're right. I think accessibility is there. I think we need to do a better job of showing how accessible it is and showing what's available to people. Um, and I just think as we continue to, this conversation right here is one step closer to letting people know it's okay to get help and that everybody should. I think if, if you know, nobody would be like in a, you know, at daycare and a bunch of kids running around the playground. And one of the kids was like, I went to the doctors yesterday. And all the other kids are like, oh, you went to the doctor? Like, nobody's going to do that because that's what everybody does. I think the same thing should be available and, you know, for, for the masses with uh, the mental health side of things. I'm really glad you brought that point up because I'd never considered the fact of, uh, I guess, that being a way for people to ease into doing therapy. It might not be exactly the uh, end-all, be-all treatment, but it gets them familiar with conversing with somebody and thinking, articulating their points, which is a, a large part of the utility of therapy. You're organizing your thoughts with a trained professional. So you may have an understanding or a recount of this incident, and you may be recounting these events and telling what exactly happened in your eyes, but you could be completely wrong. And so in through talking to them about that, you're able to organize it and really make sense of it. And uh, I think that's, that's a, a really great point. But I also want to talk to you guys and ask a question that a lot of people like myself, or maybe a Josh who haven't been to therapy, 
how do you find the right therapist? I started with Google. And then I, I remember in a prior conversation, you said that the therapist that you had the most experience with wasn't your first one. So there was some, there was a lack of a good fit or lack of appropriate fit for you and the first therapist and then you went to a subsequent one. No, that, was that not, you, Paul? No, no, that wasn't me. No, that was me. Okay, I remember I talked to someone. You and I had that. this conversation. Yeah, yeah, you and I had this conversation. And I'll tell you when I first went in 2013, I had this um, female therapist that when, when I was talking to her, she was like, yeah, it sounds like anger management. And maybe you need to go, you know, to anger management classes and things like that. And I, I didn't agree. So when I fast track, um, you know, four or five years, there was this white male therapist. And I'll tell you, you'll find the best therapist when he, when they ask questions that you don't have answers to, when you have to sit back and you have to truly think. And when you give them an answer, they're going to tell you if it's bullshit or not. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm not going to lie to you. We had a, a, a one hour session and we spent one hour trying to answer who is Desmond Tillman as a person. And I couldn't give him a concrete answer. You know, I mean, mind you, I'm 22, 23 at this time. You know, we had a podcast, um, a podcast episode earlier in um, when this started and I recited, you know, Drake's quote when he was like 23 and going through a midlife crisis, but trust me, I still deliver like a midwife and et cetera. I wasn't saying that just because it's a it was a quote like that was that was really me at the time like I was really struggling to identify who I was as a person you know I can come on podcast I can give great advice because of what I've been through but that doesn't mean you know I truly know who I am as a person I can't culminate everything that I've been through in life and give you one one sound individual and that was when I knew I found the right therapist when we couldn't figure out who I was and when I was finally able to give him that answer then we were able to dive into what was bugging me. Because if, if you don't know who you are as a person, how are you going to be able to identify what the issue is? Did you go to the person? same Did you go to the same place? You same place, left? same place, because I had TRICARE at the time. So if you guys are familiar with TRICARE, there's certain in-network in places you could go to. And I kind of, when I gave them a call back, you know, hey, it's always just like when you go to a massage, you prefer male or female. And I was like, well, let me try a male this time. Oh, okay. You know, that's yeah. I got a question. Did did you know, like, were you bef beforehand, were you able to see the person or did you just say, like, I want a male therapist? And then they he gave me a, like a name. Like, you, they were they were essentially like, yeah, we have such and such, like, name. My, my uh, therapist was Dr. Johnson. So, like, yeah, we have Dr. Johnson. He's a really good therapist. He has a lot of great reviews. I think that might be best. Because I essentially told, like, when I called the, you know, the, the, um, the therapist group, I kind of explained what my first experience was and what I didn't like. So of course I was able to kind of honestly just, or just be really honest with them and say what didn't work. And then they recommend it. So it's kind of like what Anthony said, when you go to, the, when you go see your primary care physician, they write that referral based off what they know exactly needs to be done. And it was it's kind of like that, something very similar. Yeah, and I think it's not uncommon. In fact, in many cases, it's recommended. Like if you're going through something physically, you go see a doctor, get a second opinion, get a third opinion if you need to, so you can feel comfortable with it. I think the same thing applies to therapy, right? Like you go to this first person, it's just not a fit. Yes, they all have on some level the same training. Yes, they're, you know, they're equally as professional, but they just might not vibe. They just might not be, a, think about it. It's not just physical. They're not just performing a, a procedure on your body. There's an energetic exchange that's happening. And if the energy just doesn't feel right, you know that, right? You walk out of there. You might not be able to articulate it, but you can sense, all right, you know what? That just wasn't for me. And then you just try again, right? There's no shortage of therapists. And so you can just, but I think we get into it. It's kind of like we put certain professions on a different pedestal. And so we just assume like, oh, they're, they're professional. They, they studied this for X amount of years. I better just trust what they say and do it. No, we don't have to do that. You know, we're not in a small town where there's one dentist, one therapist and one doctor and it's all the same person. Like, no, we all we can make choices now. And so I think we should we should get. And I think another thing that helps is I remember reading an entire book and a bunch of different articles on CBT 
before I even sat down with somebody. And, and when I went to search for therapists, I made sure that that was in their specialization. Like I made sure, okay, this person is trained and researched in this area and that kind of helped me. So I think there's, that's another thing that we have going for us that prior, you know, previous generations didn't necessarily have. We can research, not only can we research, uh, you know, mental health in general, we can research the individuals. Like there are reviews or people who have spoken to what this person has done for them before. There's so many different ways we can research ahead of time to know what we're looking for. I, you know, I might like this kind of therapy because I'm this kind of personality. This is how I'm inclined. So I'm going to try over here. That automatically takes a bunch of therapists off the table. And now I can pick from this group of people and just see how it goes. And you just have to know if it doesn't work out the first time, that doesn't mean therapy doesn't work. It doesn't mean that at all. I remember years and years ago, my mom, uh, she was having like some issues and she was having some chest palpitations and she was struggling and she like called ER, like she, it was like 911 situation. We got her to her primary care doctor. The doctor looked at her and said, you're just a little stressed. You need to go take a bath. That night she was in ER with a heart attack, like full blown heart attack. If it, you can seek another opinion, this, that's physically true for, you know, for physical ailments. And it's so true psychologically, mentally, and emotionally. If it doesn't work, if the information they're giving you, if the questions they're asking you, like to Desmond's point, if they're not working, try something else. Just don't give up because somebody will lock, somebody will sync up and, and you'll know when you walk out of that first meeting. Any other, uh pieces of advice on finding the right therapist. Okay, I have one last question for myself. And that happens to be, what is something that, that someone listening to us today could do immediately that they can implement in their lives to help facilitate their healing? Journal their thoughts. That's the biggest one I can, like, that's the biggest takeaway that I can give you because we met, I think, believe I mentioned last time, like my therapist introduced me to Les Brown. Motivation mm -hmm. is great. Those, you know, YouTube videos that have the speeches, those are all, those are all, you know, fine and dandy, but at some point everything has to originate up here and everything, it can only originate up here once you start putting it on paper to where you're able to decipher what truly is going on. Because I can tell you, if you can put on paper what you're feeling, when you go to therapy and it's time to have conversations, it's a lot easier because you're not jumbling your words. You're not jumbling your thoughts. Like it's, everything is articulated because it was, it was written before, it was written before. And so that's what my therapist mentioned or referred to me as, you know, I have essentially started to migrate away from them but it's like don't ever stop journaling because and i mean even a lot of the successful people today will tell you that you know they they journal daily i do it at work you know if there's ever a time where i feel like i need to motivate myself i'll just write down 10 things that i appreciate about me and i'll go about my day i echo that journaling is is hugely beneficial organizing your thoughts and allowing you to see areas of improvement like i don't personally well i have had experience with writing it physically but in my notepad app is full of nothing but just my thoughts my unfiltered thoughts in the phone so heaven forbid i'll lose somebody gets a hold of it nah i'm old school i prefer that pen and paper i tried doing it i do i did um draw on my phone at one point but i'm somebody that um i was taught cursive like in kindergarten so i've always had a knack for a nice pen and nice paper and I like it. I like it that way. I like how you brought up um, like that you like you would write 10 things that you appreciate about yourself because um, I was I was thinking along the lines of like well f first taking personal time to be just with yourself like no phone just you and your thoughts um, so like something along the lines of like med meditation um, but also like affirmations I, I feel like they, they can go a long way too. And like over time, it kind of just changes your thinking process. Cause I, I even like kind of caught myself um, a few days ago, like uh, 
because uh, Brian, I've told you, like, I've just been looking at uh, jo- applying to different jobs lately and had some some interviews. Um, so I was thinking of one that's coming up and I just kind of started getting like, I don't know, like just like beat myself up. Like, I'm like, I just start start thinking things along the lines. Like, I mean, yeah, you're probably not going to get it anyways. Like, it, like when, when it comes to the lesson, like you're going to bomb and I mean, they might go with someone else. So you might, you might start it like start thinking of like a backup plan but then like I caught myself and I'm like wait no like you're you're beating yourself up like as long as I like and just had to remind myself like as, as long as I'm doing the work to get to where I want to be like it's going to happen and if it doesn't then that was, that's that, that's out of my control because I can only be comfortable in the fact that like I did what I could I did what I, what was in my control um so yeah, de- definitely um like things like affirmations writing things down um taking time to yourself yeah i would echo both of those des you know journaling is huge right Uh, on a reflective level like introspection in and of itself is is helpful right because you if somebody said i don't write to tell people what i think i write to know what i think right i write to know what in the world it is i think you know that's helping me put it down on paper it becomes real it becomes tangible so absolutely echo that and then paul the same affirmations man every morning every midday like des said when he's going through something affirmations and and starting those affirmations with the words i am not i wish i were or one day i might like i am is is a game changer and the only thing i would add to that is a gratitude practice i think every single one of us has feelings of gratefulness at some point they just pop up randomly like one morning when you're not super rushed and you notice the sunrise mm-hmm. you're like oh that's nice like you gratefulness pops up occasionally but gratitude is a practice and so that is combing through your day and looking for reasons to be grateful things that are good that you can cling on to and in the worst day there's so many more things that happened well in that day maybe it just completely went off the rails but you can actually go through that day and find everything that went right and the more you do that it becomes this practice. And it's like, it's like when you're thinking about buying a red Mustang, right? Next day you go out on the road to drive, you see red Mustangs everywhere. Just because your brain is queued up to those things. So when you create a gratitude practice, you start finding ways subconsciously to to be grateful. And so one of the easiest things that I do, and, and I talk about this a lot, is the four things practice. And it's a gratitude practice. You do it at night. You can do it whenever, but I think it works best at night. Four things. We, it's based on the noun, right? Person, place, thing, or idea. Get a notebook out. Here's that pen. I'm, I'm with Des. I have a pen. <laughs> My wife bought me a pen, and it's heavy, and, it, and it's nice, and I keep it with me. It's important. And I think that that's helpful. Like get you a good notebook that you like, get a pen that you like, put it in your pocket. I'm the nerd who's got a pen in his pocket. Somebody's like, does anybody have a pen? I'm the guy who's got a pen. Why? <laughs> and the four things is person, place, thing, idea. So I'm going to comb through my day. What's one person I'm grateful for? It could be somebody in my family. It could be my significant other. It could be the random person at the gas station who in passing said something kind or made me laugh or whatever. The cashier at the grocery store was particularly helpful. I don't even know their name. I'm just writing grocery store clerk right there. Boom. Place, a place that uh, energizes me. It's the gym. It's my office. It's this particular room in my house. It's when I go on a hike and I sit here, that place, whether I went there during the day or I just wish I was there, a place that I'm grateful for. Whenever I go to grandma's house, the smell of the food that's cooking, whatever it is, that's my place. Thing. Now this is, it's a material good. It's something. It's the pen that I was just talking about. It's a device. It's something that when I use it, it's helpful. It's got utility or it brings back good memories, whatever it is. And the last thing is idea. I heard a quote. I read something in a book. I was in the shower and a good idea hit me. Whatever it is, write that down. And if you stack up enough days of the four things, you start to recognize that there are so many reasons in life, no matter where you find yourself, no matter where you are on the socioeconomic ladder or whatever it might be, 
there are so many different reasons to be grateful and you start to spot that stuff on accident. And I, I you, and as far as my experience goes, you can't help but be a more fulfilled person. You can't help but find more joy in your life. And, and it starts to become contagious, I think. So that's what I would add to the mix. Josh, balls in your court. Um, I don't know. I, I hear everything you guys have to say, and I do agree. Um, and I like everything, to be honest, I was going to say affirmations, but you guys really said that. Um, as far as writing it down, I do some of that also. Um, that's, that's a good idea also. Um, but I'm thinking of ways just like to get person started to, I guess, the realization like you need to heal. Uh, but I guess what I would say is like, just be alone, like make sure you go alone and make sure you're in a position to find out and what's really going on with yourself. Cause if you're not alone, a lot of times you have like external factors that come into place that'll mess with uh, how you think and everything. So I would say just be alone. That's my biggest thing. Um, but yeah, I, I like the affirmations and I like the writing it down too. That's, that's good sound advice I would say too. Uh, my last question. Hey, real quick, I oh, actually have, uh, have a, an answer for that that I really okay. think would be beneficial. So I think one of the biggest barriers to healing and just, uh, I guess, closeness in relationships, interpersonal relationships with friends, significant others, uh, therapists, is the idea that some things are too touchy. There's, an, there's an, some ideas, some things that we just can't talk about. Kind of like how they say, don't talk about politics and religion. Okay, that's, that's less important with this uh, conversation we're having today. But a lot of people feel that maybe talking about their upbringing or their relationships their family life, their children and things like that are too touchy. And I think that when you really have people who care about you and you're close with, that you can closely confide in and have these conversations with, you start to feel as you start to feel and realize, combine those there, uh, you start to realize that they aren't foreign. This is something that a lot of people face. These are things that there are commonalities between us. So I can I can listen to what Anthony's going through. And it might help me in some form or fashion. So I think really eliminating that barrier and thinking that we shouldn't talk about this because when you do that, you're really restricting your options. And so outside of just going to therapy, of course, that's probably like the, the, the most helpful thing, but even with the uh, day-to-day -day things, I can be better off through a conversation with Paul, Josh, uh, Des, Anthony, any of you guys, than if I would just keep this to myself. So I think that when you really do have uh, close people in your life that you can trust and confide in, and I do have the benefit of that. Like a lot of people talk about they don't have that benefit and they're not comfortable doing these kind of things. It's like I am because I have people in my life like that, um, relationships with my parents, my sister, uh, my friends, and not to mention like we've been doing this for 110 episodes and some change. So this is, uh, I think, really just shifting that perspective and finding people that you can have these conversations with and then start. It doesn't have to be some grandiose thing to where you're dissecting your entire life, but just start somewhere. I think it's easier. I definitely agree with that, Brian, because uh, like one of the things with, I mean, if, you're, if you go the therapy route specifically, um, I mean, one of the things, good things about that is that it's, um, well, not not anonymous. That was the first thing that came to my word, uh, word came, came to my mind, but um, they they basically, they're, they're kind of a stranger. They don't know you. They don't have any biases um like towards your life um but I mean also they're, they're professional but as, at the same time I feel like you can still get a lot of those benefits like just like you said by opening up to people um like close in your life but I mean also, also people that um can actually like take what you said and like not not put it back on you like making making you kind of almost immediately regret that you um opened up to them uh but but yeah like definitely that that's kind of something I, I've been even really realizing myself is just that like I feel I feel like sometimes I feel a lot I, I notice how much better I feel after just a conversation with like one of my friends about um or even like I'll call my brother sometimes vent to him a little bit and I know sometimes I feel like a, a lot better than after those conversations, like compared to like, if you uh, had that con same conversation in therapy too. So like there, there, there's definitely benefits to both.
Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, I do have a question, but I'll actually not ask it right now. Gosh, you can't, you can't do that to us, man. We already here. <laughs> look, look, this is a tip right. number three. <laughs> I guess. All right. Uh, my question was, uh, does time heal all wounds? Mm. Brian, you actually have the answer for this one. It's something that I told you a couple of times before, and I think it, it still rings true to just about every situation. Yep. This is uh, one of my favorite Desmond quotes of all time. <laughs> 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 and we actually, I think, did an episode on this topic. Uh, did we no so it was like after the um podcast chat like we were winding down talking about the week paused just in case for the one (laughs) 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 paul got me (laughs) (laughs) i didn't get you but yeah we were we were um we were just talking about stuff going into the week and i had said that quote because we were talking about one of your situations and and you you really like that one. You know how I am. I'm a man of many quotes, so I can't say it verbatim if you want to. I'm going to drop it. <laughs> so you were saying that removing yourself from the trauma itself does not heal you because there's still something that has to be done. There's, there's essentially, there's a wound to go back to the initial point that Anthony made. When you're cut by something, getting away from the person that cuts you does not heal you. You still have to repair it, stitch it up, treat it with antiseptics. Um, and then leave it alone. So when it's scabbing over and starting to heal back and, and come together, leave it alone and stop. Don't, don't expose yourself to things that are going to agitate it. Like there's something, there's a secondary component. So just like you said, removing yourself and, and away from the situation, the person, whatever it might be, the environment, that, is, that in itself is not going to heal you. It's a huge step. It's a part of the process, but that's not going to fix it. You can uh, feel free to correct me if I'm uh, missing anything or misinterpreting that. No, no, that was was spot on. Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's like if somebody you care about has passed, right? They've passed away and you go to the funeral, you're at the viewing and, you know, long after, you know, everybody else has walked out of the room, you're still standing there next to the casket. Like at some point you have to, to walk away from it you have to leave that thing has to be buried in the ground right it has to be so i think you know i think to what des said but then also flipping it around to the idea of uh what you said at the tail end brian is at some point you have to move on you have to walk away from it and now you have to grieve properly right you have to acknowledge the pain you have to reckon with it you have to deal with all the hurt of what you had and what was lost and what you wish had happened versus what actually happened. You have to grapple with all of that stuff. Cause if you don't, it's never gonna leave you anyways, right? You could leave the graveside, but that's still gonna go with you. But at some point you have to deal with the grief, right? You have to grieve and then you have to leave. If we wanna throw a quote on it, you have to grieve. And then after that, you gotta leave. You gotta walk away from it so that you can walk back to your life you have to get back to your life instead of you can't just spend your whole life standing next to the casket right you have to at some point walk away and get back to more life to to find your life and the possibility of an even better life that lies ahead so breathe and leave i love it anthony garcia top five mcs all time (laughs) oh my goodness all right. <laughs> Anything else you guys have? Brian? No, sir. Anthony Paul? No. Well, no, this was a uh, fun conversation, man. I really enjoyed it. So we well, I, I do have another quick question. Um because uh, yeah, I should have brought it up earlier. But earlier when uh Anthony was talking about uh like yeah, so mental mental health issues have become a, a much bigger topic past couple of years um and it's becoming a more normal normalized thing to talk about but the idea of going to um a professional every i don't know month or as whatever kate whatever the cadence is if that was if if that was something that was in effect do you think people would still people would actually like take advantage of it um 
well, yeah, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Do you think people would still actually take advantage of it? Could you, could you rephrase the question, maybe? So if, if what was the case, would people take advantage of it? I think I know what you're saying, Paul. Are you yeah. saying if it was more accessible, like I was saying earlier about mm -hmm. you know, medical from the physical standpoint, if yeah, there from the jump and everybody had access to it, would people take advantage of it or would they neglect it? I think mm -hmm. the answer off the top of my head is what we do with the medical, you know, physically right now. Like some people just don't take advantage of what's there, right? Yeah, and, that's and the thing some, that I had in mind. Some people just don't take the act. So I think, you know, I think it's always going to be this rub. And I think it goes down to, I think it was Dez. I don't know if you talked about it today or if it was the initial time, but, you know, just some people just don't want it. They really, at the end of the day, don't want to heal. And I think that might be the case here as well. Like if Just because it's more accessible doesn't mean everybody would take advantage of it. Just because it's right there doesn't mean everybody would. I think it would up the number. I think it would improve where people are all across the board, right, as a society. You know, because it's, if it's more there and it's more open and more accessible and therefore the stigma that remains is lessened, I think more people would take advantage of it. But I think at some point, if if it was just a, another program, it would lose it would lose its luster. And I think people would end up, you know, treating it the same way a lot of people treat the, the medical field. But I think if more conversations like this continue to happen and more people kept talking about the benefits of it and how it's helped them, I think it would still stay out front enough for, for people who really recognize a need to take that step and get, and get help. Yeah, I, I'm in the same boat as Anthony. I think the, the very same thing with our uh, physical healthcare system, because like you look at people with uh, good paying jobs that have really good insurance, high care, dental, all that. And they do have the means to get help for things. And then you may have somebody who falls in the category who doesn't go to the dentist and get help for a toothache until it's rotten and it needs to be pulled. So it's just making it more accessible is going to make it easier for people who actually want that help. And it's going to increase that number slightly, but there's always going to be a subset of people who are just content, like, like we talked about. I think that a lot of people don't realize it and they're just happy being the way that they are. Mm -hmm. And uh, those people aren't going to be convinced just because therapy is uh, much more regimented. It's much more, uh, I guess, regular of an occurrence for us. Like you go, okay, let's say a, a yearly checkup, kind of like you do with the regular doctor. You go in for your yearly checkup. Just because it's a yearly thing, those kind of people, they don't care. You know, what, do you go to the doctor yearly if nothing's wrong with you? my point exactly yeah right. I, mean, I don't mean to call you out or anything like that but it's just that's that's just no, how that, most people that, behave that's kind of why i asked the the question because i was thinking about myself like it's the same thing like i mean even when you get a slight little cold or like i mean like when i get sick my cough lingers for a while and my, my parents would always be like oh get that go get that checked out and i'm just, just like no i'm i'm just take care of it myself i'm i'm good or yeah, just the the uh, the yearly checkup. I I don't think I went to mine last year, <laughs> so <laughs> it's like I, it feels so like thinking about it with talking to someone and for something that could be as uncomfortable as um, it can get, uh, and like going for the yearly checkup that that's easy. You, that's all you have to do is just be there. But going to um, speak to someone you kind of you have to participate actually you can't just sit there let them touch on your body poke you prod you whatever um you have to like actually be there engaged in the conversation with them so yeah the, so that made me think you know, it might be a little different i would also i would almost say that they're a lot more similar than you think just because you're not actively uh, engaging in a discussion this, there could be a mental barrier to physical checkups as well. Like a lot of people, or I can't make that generalization, but I can I can imagine that people don't go to the doctor because they, they're afraid of what the results might be. They're afraid of what the doctor might say to them. Like they might know That's that they're overweight, point, yeah. but they don't want the doctor to say it because when you verbalize it, it's really you have to address it. And now, okay, they know that they're overweight, but what if the doctor says they have uh, high blood sugar? What if they're actually diabetic? What if they have high cholesterol? Like, now they have to do X, Y, and Z. It's like, okay, well, if I don't know about these things, they're not real. 
I can pretend they don't exist. <laughs> you know, that's 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 typically yeah. the approach that a lot of people have to problems. We don't address them so they don't exist. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else you guys have? No, sir. No. Okay. Do you have a recommendation of the week, Des? Yeah, yeah. Fall foliage is coming up, man. Go go on a good hike. Mm-hmm. I'm uh be going back up into northwestern Virginia probably within the next couple of weeks to experience the scenery, but with that nice yellow, orange, red backdrop. That's I'm re- that's probably the most this this hike coming up is probably the one I'm looking the most forward to out of the year just because I'm those are my colors. I like I like those vibrant yellow, red, oranges, you know, right before it gets ridiculously cold. So definitely looking forward to that. All right. Be sure to check it out. Uh, I want to thank Anthony Garcia and Paul for coming on uh, today's episode. Really like the discussion. Make sure you come back, okay? Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, always fun, guys. <laughs> but if you guys like the discussion, don't forget to hit the like button. We're going to see you guys, not next week, but we're going to see you guys in the next season. <laughs> Peace. <laughs> But while you're here, be sure to check out other great content from the Breakdown crew, including previous episodes of the podcast, Joshua vs. Movies, Joshua vs. Music, and of course, haven't forgotten about my plant lovers, feel the love. Just check out this begonia. <laughs>